My name is Tony Juniper. I work with WWF. It's my pleasure to moderate this little panel for the next 25 minutes or so. I'm very pleased to have uh, with us George Freeman, MP. Uh, MP, I believe, from Mid Norfolk, yep. quite near to where I live in Cambridgeshire. Amy Mount, head of the Greener UK Coalition, of which WWF is proud to be a member alongside RSPB, Wildlife Trust and others in looking for some good outcomes on the environmental side uh, from Brexit. Uh, Rianne Marie Thomas, head of Green Banking at Barclays. And Will Wells, uh, the founder and chief executive of Hummingbird Technologies. And so, um, where to begin? Well, one thing I thought this morning that was really striking to me uh, was the extent to which we do seem to have entered a new stage of this debate about the environment. And, I, you know, it literally has been uh, decades in the making, but we do seem to have broken through now into a discussion where you can have the Secretary of, the S Secretary of State for the Environment and a leading economist uh, agreeing with environmentalists that looking after our collective environment is actually good for the economy and for people. That's actually quite new. And uh, I'm not sure if we're in a little bit of a bubble here today where we're um, sharing these ideas in a particular uh, set of circumstances, but actually I do think that's rather important. And it's especially important in this discussion that we're having about the future of the environmental agenda post-Brexit, because that's where many of us have had some very considerable concerns. So, Amy, you're close to all of this. H how is it looking from your point of view and what you've heard today? Um, I, th I think there's a huge amount of energy, actually, in this conference so far, and that's because of all of you lot. Um, but really kind of positive sort of taking the political context that we've got right now and thinking about how to make the best of it for the environment and a very kind of pragmatic ap approach to that. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement. Looking, I was looking through the sort of green Brex Brexit hashtag on Twitter and uh, a lot of excitement there around uh, this idea about a new Environment Act with the Secretary of State talking about uh, not if we want to leave the environment in a better place, we need to leave the statute book in a better place. Um, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and then obviously lots of other conversations building on that, looking at the sort of institutional innovations um, that, that that would take and what, what, it would, what, what it really means to be a global leader on the environment having that firm foundation here at, here at home as a kind of springboard for, for international change as well. Um, I, think the, the, I think a really key part also that seems to be coming through the, the conversations is about empowering people through that. Um, um, perhaps some of that is uh, sort of based on an understanding of, of, of why the EU referendum went the way that it did. Um, and the sort of take back control mantra as well. But if we're talking about new institutions, if we're talking about a, a, a powerful, independent, new green watchdog, how is that helping people um, shape their world around them and, um, and, and, and providing kind of pathways to take the change that they want? And so uh, I think one of the sessions was talking about uh, maybe new rights, so like the right to a healthy environment, and how that might empower people locally to see if that ancient woodland down the road is under threat, actually we're going to get organised and, 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 and defend that. So um, the whole, whole set of interesting strands that are coming <coughs> through, but that's just a few. Thank you, Amy. George, what did you hear this morning? What, what was uh, the most striking reflection from your point of view? Well, I'd, I'd agree with the energy point. I think um, it's partly Michael Gove's kind of fizzing political uh, energy, but I think it's also the energy of a sector that wants this to be a moment of um, unification and renewal and to put aside the old arguments. Um, so I, I think there's a real opportunity here. Very often in politics there isn't, actually. Mm. Politicians talk as if there is. Very often, actually, the stars aren't aligned. Mm. I see an opportunity here, having been in agriculture and rural policy for 25 years. <laughs> Finally, mm. the environmental community and the industry beginning to realize they are actually trying to push the same thing. And modern progressive farming wants to use fewer inputs, leave less impact on soil, uh, and wants to be better connected to the consumers who want to know that when they buy an apple or a pint of milk or a bag of flour, if it's come from Britain, it will have come from the best supply chain in the world, using the best science and metrics to measure proper environmental impact. So I think there's a real excitement. I, I also say this, I mean, I was a 
very loud Remainer. Um, I'm here today because uh, I just think this Brexit moment, um, I want it to be a moment we look back at in 10 years and say, you had to be there. We actually stopped blaming everyone else. We had a pretty divisive year or two. And then we realized it's up to us. And the underlying crisis is still economic. So somehow, if, if this is just a kind of greenification of the CAP, if, if it doesn't tackle the underlying productivity crisis, the economic crisis in this country, we're carrying 1.5 trillion of debt, we've still got a structural deficit, so we've got to fuse a vision of Britain out of the European Union, still trading into that market, as frictionless as possible, but gripping our global lead. And for me, there's a huge opportunity, the science superpower connecting to the city, taking our agri-tech, our smart precision farming, our low impact farming around the world, use our aid budget, let's help the developing world. We've got a double food production in 30 years on the same land area with half as much energy and water. That's a British global challenge. We could unleash yes. our science and really do it and make the city the home of agri-tech investment and show that environmentalism and good industry go together. Th thank you, George. Will, I, I think one of the things this morning um, that came through quite strongly <clears throat> was this uh, potential synergy between uh, industrial competitiveness, technology and solving environmental problems and the UK being a global leader on all of that. Are you convinced by what you've heard this morning or is it just sounding like it's good but not actually going very far? Well, I hope so and um, I'm very encouraged by the reaction of everyone today in terms of the role that technology has to usher in this, this new era for farming, um, the role it has to play in terms of it being a vehicle for change. Um, I have 30 people three miles away, none of whom have ever been to a farm, that are coding solutions that will help farmers see disease early in their crops, um, that will help them classify weeds versus healthy crops. All of this leads directly into lower chemical inputs and a more sustainable management of that land. Environmental stewardship and more efficient food production are two things that are inextricably entwined and it would be a big mistake to say here's policy just for environmentalists or here's policy just for farmers. I think we have to make them work together um, and, and make it work so that we can take it and export it and we can be a leader. Thank you. Rianne. How do you see this from, from the point of view of finance? I wanted to pick up on the point <coughs> that you made, actually, Tony, that um, as a banker, very excited about the huge opportunity that we're presented in the city by this transition mm. to a lower carbon future. That statement that greenery and prosperity being in conflict is a complete false dichotomy. And um, I think the point was made by Michael Liebreich uh, just before the break um, about electric vehicles actually and are seeing that the economics of batteries um, becoming so favourable that the sticker price for an electric vehicle is likely to be cheaper than an internal combustion engine car by the middle of next decade. It's the commercial imperative that will really drive some of these environmental outcomes and it's, that is what's going to help mainstream some of the ambitions that we have in the room. Um, I did also want to pick up on the fact that, you know, we've spoken an awful lot about carbon this morning. Um, UK heating load, I've now learned, is six times our electrical load, so obviously we need to put energy efficiency firmly on the agenda. I also heard that only five local authorities uh, have used government funding to roll out their electric charging infrastructure. And uh, something I didn't know before, 68% of primary energy is waste, and that really skews some of the stats that we hear about how much renewables um, are contributing to the overall uh, energy mix. Uh, but it was Craig Sams who actually brought a powerful reminder in a session earlier uh, that natural capital discussion needs to be broadened from carbon. Um, he came out with an absolutely terrifying statistic that 31 football fields of soil are lost every minute. Uh, a reminder that we need to put soil and forestry absolutely at the centre of the agenda for many, many reasons, uh, not only to do with uh, food production, but also to do with resilience, flood resilience, etc., that they provide. So um, it's, been a, it's been a very educative morning. It, it has indeed been. <clears throat> and you've just reminded me, Rianne, of another point that was made this morning about the beyond carbon yes. dimensions of all of this. We, we, we know that that's obviously a huge challenge for the UK and everywhere else, but it's been encouraging today to see, going, to see the discussion going beyond that and also uh, making connections back into it. And soil, actually, is just really interesting how that subject has rocketed up the agenda uh, because it's central to everything. Water quality, food production, obviously, 
uh, and the uh, question of carbon in the atmosphere, the more of it's in the ground, the less we have in the air. And so those connections are beginning to become much more understood, I think, which is, which is, which is very encouraging. George, I wonder if, you know, this, this discussion here today, I'm just writing down a few words, renewal, opportunity, energy, global leadership, synergy, excitement. These are the things we're saying about the prospects for a green Britain post-Brexit. Do you see prospects in the, in the House of Parliament to, to be building a consensus that could encapsulate all of that and to go forward with some level of optimism about all of this? Is there some understanding of the opportunities, you think, in politics? Or is it just a little bubble in here today with all of us? Not much, really. I, um, <laughs> That's um, my fear. Uh, I mean, I think the, the understanding is actually out in the sector rather more than it is in yeah. Parliament. Um, uh, and I think the challenge for this sector is to, uh, rather as Brexiteers and Remainers have got to do, put aside their differences and seize the opportunity and shape it. Um, <laughs> I don't want to pour any oil on, uh, on happy water, but let me, I think there's some really big challenges that we'd fail this conversation if we didn't flag. Mm. Um, one is um, the siloed departmentalism of Whitehall. Mm. We will fail if we simply produce a DEFRA green strategy yep. and the Department of Energy and Climate Change does its thing in isolation and Biz does its thing um, I've been a minister in two departments, and I can tell you some horror stories about just how departmental Whitehall is. We won't grip this if we don't properly align. And, and there is an argument, I'm not going to make it right now, but there is an argument for saying, actually, it's time to just break that whole Whitehall siloism, and we should have sort of six proper departments, one for the whole global agenda, one for the whole environmental agenda, one for the whole economy, you know. But we certainly have to make sure this is integrated across departments. Second point, when I hear... God bless him, Jacob and others, talk about um, free trade, cheap food, cheap shoes, cheap clothes. I hear the cheap food and I think, so where is that coming from? And what, if it's going to be cheap enough that people are really excited, it's going to be pretty cheap. And I'm just wondering how that mediates with this conversation. Yeah. And if it's going to be American cheap yeah. food or... And thirdly, um, I'm really excited about the opportunity for us to develop, I think we have to have a bigger vision about what this is all about. It's not going to happen tomorrow. This no. needs to be a 10-year. I think there is an opportunity yeah. to take our, our clean tech, biotech, agri-tech, take it global into emerging markets. That won't just happen. We haven't got those trade networks. No. I think we're going to have to pick a few territories around the world that are getting hungry and getting cold and need help quite quickly and lean in and have a, a new model development partnership. Use our aid budget. I don't mean to do tide aid, flogging helicopters for you know, for wheat, but really lean in and make those one or two places around the world test beds for our technology and double the aid, double the trade. Right. And I, I just think there's some quite big, tough reforms that have got to be made. You can't just publish a strategy. You've got to actually get a grip of how you really turn the numbers on the bottom line. Thank you. Rianne, you wanted to come in on... on I, I just wanted to echo a point from a finance perspective about um, disparate activity. Um, and we heard earlier about um, there is no unified funding system coming from government. There are lots of, uh, lots of disparate schemes. And these are going to be really important for us to finance the agri-tech and the clean tech and all that early stage technological development that's very difficult for commercial banks such as ours to finance because fundamentally the banks are cash flow lenders as opposed to um, in the business of taking equity risk and so that partnership between government and the large commercial providers of finance we need to be thinking about how we can work in a blended way together but actually that idea of unifying some of that is something that really resonated yeah, as if well. If we don't get that right, we will end up, as we have in the other portfolio I've had of life sciences, will be a brilliant place to develop new drugs, new medicines, new diagnostics, and then they go to America, float on NASDAQ, raise the billion, and, because the market uptake isn't there. Yes. So we have to build an ecosystem. The city's not going to pile in unless these companies like yours have got a big market. Um, and creating that financing ecosystem is crucial, or else this will just be another strategy and... Uh, disparate silos. Exactly. Amy. Yeah, just b back to George's point about um, whether um, your colleagues in Parliament are, are feeling the opportunity that um, I think is a lot of that conversation is coming through today. I, I think we have, you know, there's definitely a great conversation to be had about how to make Brexit green and how to look at our 
agriculture, fisheries policies, overall kind of institutional architecture here in the UK to make that work. But also, if you look at the pieces of legislation that are going through Parliament at the moment, um, the, it's not just opportunity. So the withdrawal bill, as currently drafted, uh, still has some gaps in it that, that we're very concerned about from an environmental perspective that you could end up not bringing over the full body of European environmental law into domestic legislation as promised by, by the government. Um, there's also the trade bill going through, which admittedly that's, that's um, <coughs> focused on uh, the carrying over the existing trade deals into uh, kind of post-Brexit UK trade deals and, and not, not every new trade deal. Um, but there's still really worrying kind of um, precedents perhaps being set by that bit of legislation um, to do with how much parliamentary scrutiny, um, you know, democratic oversight of those processes. And, and I think it was James Thornton who was talking about the need for a green seam to run through uh, these trade deals. And we're, we're only going to make the most of the opportunities that we've been talking about today if we're also closing down some of the risks that would come from rushing headlong into a deal with the US, which fundamentally changes um, the way that we govern the environment here and, and you know, switching from a, from a precautionary principle to a, a, a kind of a very watered down version that they have over there. Um, and also, if, if it opens up, as I think Ruth Davis was saying, the UK and all the green businesses and all the, the nature-friendly farming uh, in this country to competition from uh, imports that, that are not held to the same standards. So, so as well as celebrating some of the opportunities, I think we do need to be realistic about the risks as well. Thank, thank you very much. Just before going to Will, I'm just going to ask you if, if anyone in the room has anything they'd like to add to this conversation in terms of things... Uh, we've picked up from this morning's uh, discussion just to put into the room. Uh, I'll do that in a moment. But, Will, first, would you like to add anything to what's being said here? I'd just, I just like to say I think we should play to our strengths when we think about global leadership. I can't talk about inward dynamics, but in terms of outward opportunities, um, London, the UK is a great place to hire talent. Um, UCL, Imperial, all of these places have so much IP under their locker that can help this entire sector. Um, we find it easier selling our software on a per hectare basis to a farmer in Russia as we do to a farmer in Lincolnshire. Well, that was until this week. Um, but in general, overseas, there's huge potential for technology in this space and ideas in this space to be tested at home and then taken over abroad. We should see it as a new era for, for expansion and GDP growth as well. Thank you. Um, so, um, gentlemen over there, please, can we nip a microphone down that side? And uh, so put your hands up if anyone else would like to say anything. Um, yes. Hello, good afternoon. <coughs> My name is Luke Douglas, I'm from Clear Public Space. Um, this is another question mainly for George, maybe the panel as well <coughs> can answer it. Is that this morning James Thornton um, referred to what I regard as the aspirational ideal of having a green legalistic body with teeth. How aspirational or real do you think this is? Th thank you, Luke. Um, let's just get a couple more if anyone wants. Uh, it, 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 you, it, it's comments, uh, not necessarily questions. Gentlemen there, please, and then, and then, then Mike here. Let's just get a few things in the room and we'll have a little round up with the uh, yeah, panel. David Barron from the University of Hertfordshire. Um, a phrase used this morning a couple of times was transition. The renewal was just mentioned by Tony on the panel here. Are we looking at renewal or are we looking at transition? Hmm. Good. Um, so, and then here, please, front there. Thank you. Very happy to reflect a gender balance in the comments and questions, should anyone... So, um, so just, just a brief comment, but I think we should just remind ourselves that at the moment we are in a bit of a bubble because we haven't actually yet left yet the EU and we are yet to start having conversations about how in future we will pool our sovereignty in other trade agreements and indeed with our nearest geographic neighbour for things like air pollution will remain our near neighbour. Um, in the future and so I think in the conversation we've had this morning we ought to reflect what does this say about the strategic choices about our trade posture and where we want to face in the world once we do actually Brexit. Thanks very much and then one right over at the back there please um, by, by the back wall and then one there the gentleman there then we'll come back to the panel so panellists prepare 
Any further reflections before we wind up the panel? Thank you. Hi, Letitia Cash, um, Client Earth. Um, we were mentioning about um, the uptake of EV infrastructure in the UK and really taking advantage of that now in the post-Brexit era. Um, from the point of view of skills and universities, there's 600,000 engineers that are needed to sort of really get us to a, a really competitive place. Is there, George Freeman, um, initiatives in the government to really get behind training because we're going to have to import a lot of that skill mm. and we don't want to lose green jobs, British green jobs. Can you say something about that? Thank, thank you very much. And then, gentleman at the back there, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nick yep. Greenstock. I think um, we, we've had a lot of uh, kind of bubblish conversations today that doesn't actually provide some form of comprehensive solution. When you, when you speak to the electorate about this, all they're going to hear is cost. <clears throat> okay? Because you haven't actually explained the, the fundamentals of the benefits that might be accrued over the course of time. And in the end, policy is driven by the electorate, whether you know, politicians like to declare otherwise. So you're going to have to try and build this into some form of comprehensive piece as opposed to very fine, well-meaning, but disparate uh, elements of, of yeah, input yeah. today. Thank, thank you very much indeed for all those comments and, and questions. So I was going to run through the panel. A minute each, please. We're running out of time. So, George? I'm going to take those three. Um, yeah. I want to endorse all three, skills, money, and express a concern. Let me be a bit provocative. I think in the same way the Remainers need to get together with Brexiteers, I'd like us to stop talking about Brexit. Let's call it EU2. Um, I think the environmental movement has got to stop thinking of this as its final victory. And I think we've got to re recognise that we have to reconcile an economic prosperity agenda, the clues in the name of this conference, prosperity underpinning quality, and the two come together. And for me, that's about, in food and farming, it's about metrics. It's not about industry over here, and then we have a green strategy over here, and the two will fight. It's about saying, we want to support modern supply chains, which we use less plastic, less water, less soil compression, and we'll give industry metrics to work on, give industry something to measure, and they'll deliver for you. Simply give them green aspirations, they won't. Um, at, and to do this, we're going to need to invest in skills for tomorrow. And I, I want that at the heart of our industrial strategy. But we won't carry the electorate unless we tell them one story. Britain is going to lead in the world in modern, progressive, lean, green supply chains. We're going to lead in the technology, export it outside of Europe, and they will copy and follow us because we will be moving so fast and so inspiringly and starting new companies and new jobs. Th thank you very much, George. I hope that's a premonition as well as a point of view. Amy. <laughs> um, okay, so on, on, on two things, uh, the, the, this green watchdog idea, uh, definitely not a twinkle in the eye. I've been talking with people in DEFRA who are drawing up the consultation, who, who, uh, which should be coming out shortly, and hopefully it will be as robust and independent, as well-resourced as it needs to be to get the job done. Um, on green stuff as cost, I, I, I don't think that's an accurate... Com uh, uh, characterization of how the electorate sees these things. I think, uh, you know, a friend of mine, his daughter was hospitalized the other day because of asthma caused by a particularly bad day of air pollution. Yeah, that is a cost. It's a cost to us if our farms and, and, and fishing industries cannot continue long into the future because the natural systems on which they depend have been systematically undermined by an unsustainable economic model. So a lot of the, what the really interesting conversations that are starting to happen today, I think, are about how to bring those, those two together so that you don't have one undermining the other, but you can have a thriving economy and you can have a resilient natural world that's going to take us long into the future. Thank you. Rianne? Predictably, I'm going to pick up on the cost and benefit point um, and say it's not just the electric that needs to be uh, convinced of that. I think it's big business. I think it's the banks. Um, I think uh, we heard this morning uh, Steve Waygood from Aviva gave a particularly helpful tutorial about how there are incentives throughout the investment chain that are impeding our ability to really integrate natural capital into financial decision making. Um, and I do think that the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, being championed by Mark Carney is going to be an absolute step change um, in terms of how we're disclosing how climate and carbon and impacting business and banking. Thank you very much indeed. Well, yeah, I think ag tech, uh, clean tech, the green economy and farming should all be exciting areas that the electorate um, wouldn't mind if, if, if the right and fertile environment um, was there for young people to move into the space, to help to change it, to shape it. It created jobs and helped our economy. I, I don't think there, there should be a cost um, negative association with it at all. 
Thank you all very much indeed. So, um, so we started with, with a sense of optimism, renewal, opportunity, and I think in the, in the second half of the panel we heard about some of the things we need to do to make sure that we can seize those opportunities. One was to break out of silos. We can't leave this all to DEFRA. We need a cross-government effort on this. Uh, we need alignment between different areas of policy. We seem to be facing in two directions at once right now. On the one hand, cheap goods and services through a free trade approach compared with high environmental standards and leading in the world on the other through a green uh, Brexit approach. We can fix some of this through metrics, we're being told, and we need to be careful of having a bigger vision and getting beyond the details. We, we, we heard that too. We heard that some of the opportunities are being locked down now in the withdrawal bill, and we need to make sure that we make the most of that opportunity to get ourselves in a good place. And we need to be playing to our strengths, was Will's point, and investing uh, in skills, apart from anything else. And we need to be taking account of the electorate, was another point that I heard, and the extent to which we need to be carrying the voters with us on this uh, ag agenda. And then finally, I, I, I heard um, some very inspirational thoughts from George about the need to be moving fast, giving clear signals, and really making the most of the opportunity for global leadership, which is there right now. But it won't just come by itself. We need to be really investing the time and effort into making it happen. So I think we'll leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Should we just thank our panelists? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.